today I'm really honored to have my boyfriend <laughs> on the channel. <laughs> oh, see how cute he oh. is. <laughs> okay, for real though, it's not my boyfriend, but as you can see, we have dressed for the occasion. It's corporate what? Corporate Tuesday. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's corporate Tuesday. Yeah. So as you can see, I'm wearing my suit, my blessed suit, and Dennis is in his tie. You want to tell us where you work? Don't worry, works are well bound. So those who are interested in having, he's not my boyfriend. Let me say it. Dennis is not my boyfriend. He's my son, not my biological son. I adopted him when he was in his first year at the University of Ghana. I met him there, and since then, he has been. The world to me. Our well, world? Yes. But it's true. <laughs> so I'm having Dennis here as the second guy on my YouTube channel. And I invited Dennis over because I'm in Kumasi. Dennis lives in Kumasi. So those of you who are interested in him, you can send your CVs to me. Okay. I'm gonna post it to Kumasi, then we can take it from there. So I'm in Kumasi and Dennis came over and I was like, why don't we do a video together? Yeah. Yeah, so we are doing it. And Dennis, I know maybe what we are going to talk about is going to be a little difficult, but I hope you don't mind sharing. I don't mind sharing. So can you introduce yourself to us? Yeah, hello guys, my name is Dennis Mahama. And as Essie rightly said, I am a, a humble son. <laughs> humble? Yes. You don't look humble at all if you're designer in clothes and oh, everything. I'm very humble though. Oh yes, I'm yeah, very yes. Humble. it's very humble. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm privileged to have someone special to mentor me, to guide me and bring me this far. So I'm also privileged to be on the channel this evening. Why are you telling everyone that we're recording the evening? <laughs> I'm happy because we are going to be talking about men and mental health and we are going to talk about <laughs> We are going to be talking about just like grief, yeah, grief. Because I met Dennis when he was a little boy in university. <laughs> I was in my fifth year in university at the University of Ghana and Dennis was in his first year. We met in church and I took an interest in him and decided to check up on him. Up till now, I don't know why I decided to check up on him. I believe it was God that orchestrated everything to happen. And I am so glad that I did meet him because mm -hmm. he has been, yeah, he has been nothing but good and nice to me all these years and very faithful and very caring so dennis it's good to have you on the channel thank you for having me ah it's good it's good <laughs> so dennis can you tell us about yourself okay hello guys my name is dennis mahama i am um i'm now doing my service i completed university of ghana reading BA Administration, Economics and Finance. Yeah, the title says it all. <laughs> so, it's good to have you, Dennis. And I know what we are coming to discuss can be a little difficult to share, but that was my mood falling down. <laughs> but I know um, you doing this will help a lot of people. That's why I said you should come. And I'm very happy that you agreed to do it. So Dennis, can you tell us about um, the first time you experienced grief in your life? Yeah, so the first time I experienced grief, unfortunately, um, it was it was it was something I didn't anticipate. Looking at the person that left my life. So I was in school, I was in um, SHS by then. I went to Asantemai Senior High School okay. in Kumasi. And my sister came to pick me up. It was vacation, my first term in first year. Okay. Then I was told one of my teachers was looking for me. I went um, to meet the teacher. 
with your it, sister? With my sister. No, I didn't know my sister was in Okay. So I went to meet the teacher. Then I saw my sister with the teacher. Okay. And my sister was in black. That was like someone coming from a funeral or someone mourning. So for me, I wasn't thinking about anything because um, why would somebody die in my family? So me, I was just like, ah, what is this girl doing here? <laughs> because I can come home, so what is she doing here? So yeah, and I knew my brother was, wasn't feeling well. He was sick, he was admitted in the hospital. I had made plans to go to the um, camp meeting to pray for him. So me, I knew that because I was praying in school and then fasting, I had fasted for almost two weeks wow. for my brother. Whenever I call my mom, she'd be like, oh, it's okay, it's getting better. Not knowing that all those, all that while um, he had left already, but they didn't know how to approach me. Your brother had passed away. Yes, he had passed away. And my sister came for visiting, she didn't tell me anything. She actually brought me food from the funeral. I didn't wow. need to they didn't want to tell me because I had um, I had to write exams. Okay. So after the exam, that was when they were actually coming to take me. So I wasn't there for the one week celebration. And my teacher called me. I met my sister, and then my sister told me, um, with the help of the teacher, was able to disclose that information to me. And I couldn't believe it. My sister showed me pictures. I didn't believe it. I felt like pictures of a funeral. Yeah, like yes, it's true, my but I, I felt deep inside me that he was alive. He was alive because whenever I went to pray, I felt this peace in me that yes, God was in charge and everything was okay. So getting to know he had left it was like so why did I even fast? Why would I pray? And I, I started thinking about a whole lot of things. Maybe I didn't pray well, or maybe I did something. And my brother was very close. He was the one that even motivated me to do business okay. as a course at the um, SHS. So I felt like, no, this, this wasn't good because I've, I've prayed, I've done what I need to do as a Christian. So this shouldn't happen to me. My brother was very innocent. He died at the age of 23. Wow. And so that was the first time I felt it. So how old were you at that time? Um, that was um, 2000 and 2000 and 2013. So 2013, I should be around 16 years. Oh, okay. I was 19. I had just finished senior high school. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think 13, uh, 15, 16, around that time. Okay. My condolences. Yeah, so that was that was the the first experience. The first time I I I couldn't stand. And my sister held me like she held me very close and all my mates could see like there was something wrong with me because I still couldn't believe it till I was at my brother's funeral to observe it personally because I was like this is serious mm. yeah so you are saying first time that means you have dealt with grief multiple times yeah, but this kind of grief was kind of different from all the others. To have someone that you are you look up to, someone that inspires you, live your life forever, and you didn't get the chance to even see the person to say goodbye. It was very painful. Okay. Yeah. So that's what made it different. Yeah. So after that, when again did you experience grief? Yeah, so that was in the 100th uh, first term, um, first year. So first semester? First, no, that we, we do terms. So oh, okay, senior high senior school. Senior high, yeah. So, um, form two. You see, my father was really 
worried so from one your brother passed out, passed out. now from, from two, two. Yeah, so my father was really worried about how my brother lost his life he was you know a stout man but then he started losing weight and it was because he was very worried and so what, what happened was that he also fought sick and we were in Obwasi by, by that time and then we had to move to Kumasi because he was admitted at uh, Kumasi and um, CAF Confirmation Hospital. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes when I'm in school, I'll leave school and then go to the hospital to check up on him. And he was very strong, he was um, 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 receiving um, treatment very well. And so we were okay. And then suddenly it started getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And we couldn't do anything about it. You go to some time, you go there, then he looks at you, and then we couldn't talk. So I went to I went to school, and I came back again. By this time, around, they couldn't lie to me because I had a dream, and in the dream, my father was advising me. And when I woke up, I called my mother and I asked my mother, Dad, I want to say, how's my dad? And she was like, he just passed out. So for, for that experience, they couldn't lie to me because my dad himself had showed himself to me that he was living. And I didn't really have that kind of relationship with my dad because he was very disciplined but I felt like something was wrong because he was very strong like healthy. very healthy so I, I was like how? 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 and I was now starting to be afraid because if I call my mom and she doesn't pick up if I call my sister she doesn't pick up or my elder br brother and then he doesn't pick up then I will feel like uh, something's going on yeah because I'm not hearing from them and I'll be very worried like I want to hear so have you heard from this person have you heard from this um, this person yeah, so that was what happened in um, form 2 second term yeah I lost my dad wow very painful My very last experience was when I went to CAF. He wasn't able to talk, but immediately he saw me. He gave me a certain t shirt and he pointed at the t shirt and then he pointed to himself that I gave him this t shirt, but he didn't talk. He was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. He said, Yeah, he gave me that t shirt. That was the very last experience I had with my dad. Okay. Yeah. So this was. A second episode of grief. A year after. Right, like a year after yeah. your brother passed away. Then there's one that I know. <laughs> your mom. My mom. So this was how many years after the first one? Yeah, so that was I think three years or two years. Yeah. After your brother and your father two passed away. Two years after. Two years after. So, with my mom, <laughs> so I didn't really feel that impact, even though I, I said earlier that I didn't really have that kind of relationship with my dad. He was working in Obwasi, we stayed in Kumasi. He comes weekends, so we didn't really spend my time. He was very disciplined, so whenever he comes, he was very strict on us. So, I didn't really feel that impact, that absence, because he wasn't always there in the first place. So my mom was my dad, my best friend, my everything. And by God's grace, I completed the SHS and I was teaching. When my dad died, we had to move to Obwasi. So we were all staying in Obwasi. We moved from Obwasi to Obwasi. Okay. Yeah. And my sister was in nursing school. She went to school. I also started teaching, so I had to come to Kumasi to stay with my uncle so that I can go to school. And teach. Okay. So now my mom was staying alone. 
Okay. Right? She was thin and mean. And for me, I always see this. My mom knew she was going to die. How did you know? Okay, so there was this Easter. My mom called all of us to come home. She cooked our favorite food for all of us. Different days. I ate pamuku. My sister ate jollof. She prepared tea for us to eat. And then um, watch it for my senior brother. He likes that very much. And then before I left for school, you know, I was teaching by that time. She gave me a new sponge, a new towel, a new comb, a new afro comb. And she was like, you know, I used to come and go, so I was like, oh, I'll come, maybe two weeks after I'll come, so don't worry. And she was like, I don't go. Yeah, don't go, like, why? And she was like, I don't want you to go. She wasn't giving me any reason, but she just didn't want me to go. And I was like, and you don't have to go and teach, right? You are resuming school, so I have to go and teach. Say, yeah, but I don't go. And I was the last person to leave. My sister had left, my sister brother had left. And I remember when we were going, she'd be like, it's all cool. Like, so you are going. It's like, so, so you are going. When you go small, you'll be like, oh, so you are going. And I felt like I had no choice because I had to go to school the next morning. Yeah. So I had to leave a person. So I took a taxi and far from where I took the taxi, when I looked back, I saw my mother, she was still standing and she was looking at the car. Uh. So I left Oboise on Sunday and I lost my mother on Friday. Wow. She I was lost her five days. After that. And within that five days, she called me on Monday. And she called. She was like, so you not call me. I was like, oh, I'll call you, I'll call you. Like, you don't call me. Eh? Then maybe three hours later, I was like, I, I was waiting for your call. You said you called me, so I was waiting for your call. And my mother is very hard for you to see her, you know, demand for calls and all these things. So I spoke with her on Wednesday. But she wasn't sick. She wasn't sick. She was very strong. She was fine. I spoke to her on Wednesday. She said she was fine. Everything was okay. And on Thursday, that was the day I didn't talk to her. I was even about calling her, but it started raining. So I decided to call her later. But if it escaped me, I wouldn't need to. She died um, Thursday. She died Thursday dawn around 1 a.m. in the morning. So that's Friday dawn, 1 a.m. in the morning. And you know, nobody was there. She was locked inside the room because she was in the room alone. She called for help, but they couldn't enter because the place was locked, so they had to break out. So before they got her to the hospital, she died in the car. Hmm. So, how did I find out? I was in Kumasi, my sister was in Kumasi. How did we find out? So, I already said that if I call my mom and she doesn't pick up, then I begin to think very far what's going on, why is she not picking up and all these things. So I was with my uncle and my uncle had a call. I was preparing for school and then he had a call and then he went out. Then immediately he came inside, his eyes were red. So I was like, why, what was going on? I knew it wasn't related to me, maybe a friend or somebody died. But just, just to clear my conscience, I was like, let me call my mom. So I took the phone and then called my mom and he didn't go through, he went through, nobody picked up. I called again, he went through, nobody picked up. And then I called some of the neighbors to see if they see my mother that morning. I called, he didn't pick up. I called my auntie, she didn't pick up. 
then I had to call my sister. So I called my sister and I was like, has she heard from my mom? And then she was like, oh, she heard from her yesterday in the evening. She spoke to her in the evening around 7 p.m. That was that Thursday, 7 p.m. And she was okay, she was fine. She even went to visit some family members. And I said, oh, okay, this is what I saw my uncle do. Like, okay, don't worry, if anything, she'll call me. Okay. Then, she called back again to tell me that they said my mom wasn't feeling well, so they have admitted her at the hospital. So I didn't say anything. I didn't change. I just took money with my slippers. I didn't know. I was wearing slippers. I didn't tell my uncle I was going to Obuasi. I just took a car to Obuasi. And surprisingly, when I go to Obuasi, immediately I lighted. My sister was also I like I lighted from the bus from Mampo. That was where she was going schooling and there was somebody there one of our uncles was there because maybe they knew we would come so he was to take us to the place and the hospital, hospital where yeah. your mother was at mm. then whilst we were going like oh me not call me i i have a call now i just had a call so i have to take something from the house then we were very annoyed. You are taking something. You just leave us. You want to go and see our mother. So you just go. Said, oh, we'll finish right now. Then this guy took us to the family house. And we went to the family house. And when we entered, I saw some people in black. I wasn't even thinking that about it. It can't be possible because my mother is at the hospital. We are just here to take something, something and then go. We were there, nobody was saying anything. I was like, ah, this man, hey, please, me, I'm going home. Then people were trooping into the family house. They were wearing black. I still didn't want to think about that. So we waited, nobody was saying anything. So I went out, took a taxi, and went to our house. Before I got to the entrance, I heard people, people were crying, shouting, and when I got to the entrance and I saw the people there, they were my family members crying, they were mourning my mother. Immediately I saw them, I knew something was wrong. And then I left that place. They followed me up and I took a taxi and went back to where my sister was. So before my family were, you know, told me that was the what happened, I had already what did you know? At that particular time, all that I wanted is that they should just take me to where my mother is. And when I go there, I believe if I pray for her, she will wake up. God cannot do this because I remember when I lost my dad, I prayed that God shouldn't take anyone else from me again. That was my prayer every time. That God shouldn't take anyone else from me again. God shouldn't take anyone else from me again. At the time, so, you thought God was taking people. Yes. And people tried to, you know, talk to me to let me understand that it was all part. But for my mother, it was no good area for me. I said it to God that God shouldn't, even if the evil one is plotting for my mother, God shouldn't take care of me. She was my everything. So, how do you feel now? Do you feel God took it? Or you don't know what you feel? For me, because I know you're a Christian. Yeah, I'm a very staunch <laughs> Christian. But, you know. Love of Jesus. Love of Jesus. <laughs> very audacious. But this was a very serious moment for me. I'm see my mom changed a lot of things about me I didn't really believe God anymore I didn't feel the need to pray I felt I still looking down on myself I felt like I didn't deserve where I was I had an opportunity one of the best opportunities anyone would have to go to the premier university University of Ghana Lekon. yes I was very privileged um, and at the place, I felt like 
And so you were level 100 first year yeah. at the university? Yeah, my after BA, I, finance, economics. Yeah, so right after my mother's funeral, I think three months, that was when our results were out again at the machine. Luckily for me, I had um, tech and then I had Legon, I had to make a choice. But because of the whole funeral, this, this thing, I just wanted to leave. Because people were coming, oh, don't worry, everything will be fine. We wanted to, you know, encourage you. And whenever people encourage me about my mom, I was very annoyed. My sister wanted to step in for my mom and was very annoying. annoying. So I decided to move from Kumasi, move from everyone, go to a new land where I didn't know anybody, where I didn't have any friends, just to have my peace and start so that afresh. I start afresh. Yes. I just went there to just go and mourn. I didn't go to Legon to go. I just went to Accra to mourn in peace. Because I knew I wasn't going to be okay. So that's the reason why. So even though my mother wanted me to go to Kwame Kuma University of Science and Technology. Technology that's Kenya University. I had to make a choice to go to University of Ghana and I did. Yeah. And that's where we met. Ah. Yeah. And let me just say this. At the time I met you, you were I remember that day I was in my room, I was like, ah, let me just check up on the people in my my Bible study group. And I was just checking up on people. How hello, how are you? Up to now, I don't remember the message I sent you, but I remember you texted me back that your mother had passed away. You said some things. I'm like, I need to meet this guy. You said that. Okay, so you mean now? If you have anything to talk about, I can talk to you. Yeah. And I really needed someone to talk to. I don't. I told you this sometimes. I don't know if you still remember. I had episodes of trying to commit suicide. Yes, I think that's what freaked me out. Like I was like, I need to see this guy as soon as possible because I was in my, I think my fourth year of living with a mental health condition. So I knew how real these things are. If I didn't have a condition, if you had said that, I would have said, oh, I'm sure it's just one of those things as a first year student to come to the school and everything is new, everything feels difficult, so you just want to kill yourself, so it will pass. But when you told me the series of events that led to you wanting to take your own life, I knew that I had to see you and talk to you as soon as possible. Yeah, and I'm glad you did. <laughs> I'm so glad, I'm yeah, so glad. wouldn't be here if you didn't meet. Yes. Yes, and I believe um, God orchestrated everything because um, I, I, my motive at the time, I had just come back from my study abroad program in Benin. All my friends were also gone. It was my fifth year in the university. I was resetting three courses I had failed. I Look, I didn't come back to come and save anyone. <laughs> But I just felt like, look, I say, all your four years you've been in school, you haven't made any impact in anybody's life. Life. So I had been telling God, God, I want to help people. I want to help people. Just that I didn't know that you put the people in my Bible study class. That's why when I came back to Ghana, I was very ujacious in the church, you know. And I just wanted to help. And you know, at the time. I know people may have thought, ah, why am I so crazy about helping people? But I just became very concerned because I realized that, look, the people, they come to church every Sunday, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But after Sunday, they have real issues they are dealing with. And if you don't deal with them privately, maybe they will not, they will even stop coming to church and you will not see them again to talk to them. And the good thing to that God did was I ended up in the same hall with you. So yeah. the proximity was mm -hmm. very close. Yes. So we could spend time in the garden, sit down and talk. I can't believe we didn't even take any pictures. But <laughs> you know when you're working, yeah, you forget yeah, yeah. you forget to take pictures. So uh, we have, we, have we did take one picture, picture but I, that picture I have to I go remember when I was leaving for the first vacation. 
Yes, yes, yes. Your first vacation. Send it to me now. <laughs> if he finds it, I'll put it in here. I was, I was, it's like, oh, my baby's going home. I don't want anything to happen to him. And I was just so happy for you. And I really want to know, how did you get through all this? Because now you are doing your national service. You were in... University of Ghana for four years doing very difficult courses. <laughs> you became um um how do you call those people? Hall rep twice in Hall the president. church. Hall president. Sorry, Hall President. Yeah. Twice in the church. And it doesn't always happen like that, which shows that Dennis was a very serious person. So they had to elect him twice because he he was very hard working. Yeah. And <laughs> and you know all the like when you look back now how did you get through all of that because at a point you had to now be helping people and honestly speaking i know it's the grace of god that got you through all that but how did you also like get through all that yes. because dennis didn't see any psychologist no psychiatrist we also didn't, you were not, you didn't end up with a mental health condition, no medication. So how did you get through all this? Because I'm sure someone's watching and is thinking they have experienced loss. They can't live again. Their life is over. Nothing makes sense anymore. You don't believe in God. All these things. How did you get through it? Yeah, so I would say that um, I was very privileged. Again, I would have to say this. I was very privileged I met a senior. And some other people who were very, um, who sold very, very, very quickly in my life. Essie was very patient. She was not always. <laughs> yes, not always. <laughs> because we, <really? laughs> especially about uh, quiet time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember. Yes. And and the reason why I wanted you to do your quiet time every day was because. I I believe in the fact that um, quiet time, when you wake up in the morning, you know, sometimes what you do in the morning is what will determine how your day will go. So I wanted you to spend time with God's word, um, like take, get your Bible, your devotional, learn from it. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the, the word of God. And I believe that would that's what will make you stronger. That's what made me stronger in my mental health journey. That's why people come to me all the time and say, how do you do it? How come we all take medication? How come your journey is so different? And I tell them, look, it's God who strengthens me and all that because we all do the same medication, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapy, all that. But that's what also gives me that boost. So that's why I wanted you to do it because I knew I was running out of time. It was my final year in university and you were going to spend another four years in that university and I wouldn't be around all the time to talk with you. I also knew that I was entering another season in my life where I would be starting national service. At the time, I didn't know where I was going to work, whether I'll have the privilege of always seeing you whenever I wanted to. I didn't know. I even moved far away, so <laughs> I just didn't know how things were going to go. And I, I knew time was was taken. I had only two semesters. So that was like my, I had to do some crash course for you so that when I leave, I wouldn't be worried about you. And I also had to pray a lot for you. You know, it's very difficult to watch. You know, when you see people, you can't always know what's running through their mind. And personally, I haven't experienced like grief or loss yet. And I know it's very difficult because um, I've seen people around me lose people and I do not understand the gravity of the situation yet. You know, it's different when it's you and it's different if someone. someone else. You see, so I just wanted to make sure that I'm getting everything right so that at least you bounce back and 
I, I began to see it. You started having some life in you, you know, mm -hmm. at least socializing with people, coming to church, going to class, you know. And I think your decision to move to Accra was also good because now you are meeting new people, new environments. It sort of distracts you in a way from thinking about all the grief back here in Kumasi where we are now. And I'm so proud of you and I'm also glad other people helped in the situation. So that means that grief is not something you need to do alone, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't do that alone. Yes. You might think you need to be alone. That's good for you to have you know, that loneliness for a while. But if it keeps long, it becomes dangerous. For me, at that time, because of my relationship with my mom, I needed someone who would care for me, someone who would check up on me. Mm, and right. it shouldn't be someone who is doing it because they know my condition. You just want them to be like how my mother would check up on me. So my sister would call me, but I know my sister would only call me because she knows my mother is in there, so she's trying <laughs> to stay in. Yeah. So whenever she calls, I get angry. It's like you are just she, reminding she me. her voice like my mom has been eating or like oh she, I don't like that 